let me frame this just a little bit. We're gonna spend some time in Ephesians 6 today. I love Ephesians 6. You're not supposed to have favorite passages probably, but I don't know. This one, it just always, I always come back to it. So I was thinking we have been studying the, uh, we've been studying biblical womanhood pretty hardcore in the last couple months. And we have been really looking into the word. What does it say about who we are? And, and what does God say about who he is, how he loves us and, and the ways in which he wired us and created us to be? And I don't know about you, but I have, I've been blessed by looking at his word and not having any nuance and gray issues and just like, going, Lord, what do you say about who I am and what I'm supposed to do? I love that. And we've been studying that, and I think it's, I think it's so, it, it's, it's just a, such a great stride to get in because you just find you're like kind of clicking along with the manufacturer's design. This is how we're supposed to be. But the trick is, is that the world wants to kind of jump in, and especially as you're like, well, the study's done. We're gonna get into summer. We're gonna get into vacation mode. We're gonna get into all the things that we wanna do. And we're gonna start flooding your news feeds and we're gonna start flooding your friends and just different things that are going on with messages that are opposite of that. And, and so I wanted today to kind of remind us of what the word asks us to do to kind of armor up against some of that stuff. Um, and, and particularly, I'm keeping it within the lane of, you know, of the messages that the world wants to send at you. But this obviously goes into many areas of our Christian walk because we're told to put on the armor of God. So that's kind of why I want to hopefully give us some really solid footing that we go into these summer months. Whether that means your schedule looks exactly the same that it's been for the last, you know, every single day. You're like, I go to work or, I, you know, I, I change diapers or I feed kids or whatever it is. Sometimes if you're a teacher or, or if you've got kids in school and their kids are home, your days do look a little bit different in the summer. And sometimes it's easy to let some of the things go a little bit. And, and while we can be re relaxed, you know, maybe and not be so, we don't want to be so rigid about everything all the time, but spiritually, we always want to have that armor really in place. And, and so that's why I love Ephesians 6, 4. So I, I want to give us a little bit of context, but we're going to spend most of our time here in Ephesians 6. But I want to give some context into a couple passages back. Because the other thing that Ephesians just does, if you're like, man, where should I study this summer? Maybe just pick Ephesians. I'm telling you, it's, there's some good stuff in there. But if you'll turn to Ephesians, we're gonna spend most of it in Ephesians 6, but I wanna back up to Ephesians 4 first. Let's look at Ephesians 4, and we will, um, we'll start in verse 24. And like I said, I have a lot of scripture. So if I read this really quick, hey, don't worry. Just make a note and go back and read it again. It's good. Okay, um, Ephesians, I said Ephesians 4, 24. This is a long list in some ways of what, what God tells us what, through Paul, some of the things that we need to have in our Christian walk. And he says, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God and the true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity for the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as good for building up and as fit the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as Christ in God forgave you. So I wanted to start with this list because in some ways, this kind of is the backdrop of where we're at in our, in our Christian walk. And it, it gives us this long laundry list. So I'm just gonna go through these quickly. And you know Amy loves check boxes, but it's worthwhile to note some of the things that Ephesians 4 tells us, even before we get into the armor of God, some of the things that we're supposed to just kind of have as part of, our, part of our walk with the Lord. And one of the things he says is just don't lie. Don't lie, okay? He says, speak the truth. We saw that in there. We see that he says to be angry and do not sin. Now that's interesting because of the time we, we just think, okay, I, I need to not be mad. I need to be, you know, I, I need to, it actually says be angry. There's things we're supposed to be angry about actually. Things that make God angry should grieve our hearts and should make us angry, but do not sin. 
That's the key right there. Give the devil no opportunity, okay? So this is one of the things that I think we could kind of like, we could marinate on this one a little bit because sometimes whether it's downtime, whether it's mindless scrolling, whether it is that break in the schedule or you're like, you know what? I've been studying the word every morning. I think I'm just gonna take a break for a minute. Nope, that's giving the devil an opportunity there to leave you wide open. So give the devil no opportunity, it says, work hard work hard. We are called to still labor with our hands, get a little dirty and it's actually okay, but work hard. Uh, We're told to share, share with one another. Sounds just like what we tell our kids, right? Share, share. We're told to do not speak corrupting, unsound, rotten. And I threw that definition in putrid. We just don't use the word putrid enough, but our words actually can have a, almost a bad smell to them. They can be so vile. We don't think of that. We don't think of our words as actually like having even a yucky smell. Think of it as green and molding and all the things. Do not speak corrupting words, unsound, rotten, or putrid words. We have to guard our tongues. Build others up. We want to be builders, uh, builders of each other. Get rid of bitterness, wrath, anger. See, now here it says the opposite. It says, don't be angry because those, that's the anger that you are sinning in. So don't do that. Shouting and perversion tells us to do all those things, but be kind and forgive. So it's a list, right? There's a lot of lists. I kind of like lists. Doesn't mean you have to conquer that list in one day. It also doesn't mean that you conquer it at all. And you're like, wait, wait, what did you mean? I'm supposed to be doing this list or I'm not supposed to be doing this list. Well, that's where Ephesians 6 is gonna come in because the thing is sometimes we can look at lists like this and go, hey, I gotta do this, I gotta do this, I gotta do this. If you try to check every box in your own strength because you just think you have it all together, we're gonna fail miserably. It is only in the Lord that we're able to do this list. And it's a good list. We shouldn't just chuck it because we feel like, oh, that's just a lot of things. We could spend something. We should spend some time actually praying about how am I doing on some of these things? How am I doing on each of these things? That's a good focus, even for your summer months as you're thinking of, eh, it's a little vacation time. And it's also time to be working hard, even if that just means diligently in the scripture and not you know, actually doing your normal day-to-day job. Doing all of those things, working heartily as unto the Lord. I love this list. So again, like I said, this list, we gotta be careful that we don't do it in our own strength because that's just not gonna be possible. So now I want you to go ahead and flip over to Ephesians 6. And now I'm gonna read this passage and then we're gonna back it up and we're gonna go through it. So we're gonna read these 10 verses in uh, Ephesians 6, starting in verse 10. And it says, finally, be strong in the Lord, And in the strength of his might, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand firm, Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Okay, I'm gonna pause there. I know I have a couple verses up, but we'll get to those in a minute. But I wanna back up. If you'll start at the beginning of this, because it kind of launches off just what we were talking about from Ephesians 4, about how important it is to make sure you're not trying to do this stuff in your own strength. So what does it mean when we see these scriptures that say, in the Lord, in the Lord? How do I be in the Lord? And the great thing about the word is it, it tells us how to be in the, in the Lord. So a few verses on that. One of them is 1 John 3, 24. It says, whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. And by this, we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he gave us. This, this is the key. This is the in the Lord part. How do you not have corrupting talk? How do you share with others? How do you work hard? You do so in the Lord. And then it says, well, how, how do you do this, this part? And he says, keep my commandments. Well, this is where we talk about this all the time. At, at, at Athe, we talk about this at Devoted, to know his word, right? Because if you don't know what his commandments say, if you don't know that prescriptive of what it looks like to be a woman designed and operating, functioning, and walking exactly as he designed you to be, you don't know that. You don't know the commandment to keep. 
So that's a key part of this, right? You've got to know his commands. But if you do that, then you abide and you're just in him. And he is the one that gives you the strength to do that. Another in the Lord passage here that I love here is in is in John 15, four, and it says, "'Abide in me, and I in you, "'as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself "'unless it abides in the, in the vine, "'neither can you unless you abide in me.'" So this is like, let me just, again, what I told you earlier, you can't do it on your own. You're just not gonna be able to do it. But he says, if you abide in me, you, this is how you do this. You can do this if you abide in me, if you stay with me, if you see that I am your strength, you see that the spirit working within you is the thing that brings all that good fruit. But apart from him, we won't bear good fruit and we'll be apart from him. Now, this word abide that keeps coming up in here, I love this because in the scriptures, it's kind of a, a it's like a, a dwelling word. It's live, it's remain, it's kind of, it gets, it's a get cozy word. And, and one of the things I, I love about this, you know, there's always the, um, you know, the, the Pinterest-y quiet time verses with like the candle and the perfect cup of coffee, which is hopefully completely black and has no cream in it to taint it and disrupt it. Um, or, and, and the Bible's open and the journal's there and it just looks beautiful. And sometimes I criticize that a little bit because I think sometimes we, we put things out there for a highlight reel as opposed to, you know, the mom who's got like, you know, hair all over the place. She's doing dishes, but she's got a post-it note for a sticky note you know, or for a verse right there. And, she, and she's reading that. Well, guess what? That's your quiet time too. That, that is you actually taking in the word as opposed to the beautiful, serene, classical music in the background, you know? But I would also flip that because if that beautiful aesthetic that you're presenting with the coffee and the candle and this, this lovely serene environment, if that is the abide that is what your heart looks like towards the Lord, that you're that kind of cozy, comfortable, and you have made it beautiful for the Lord, I think that's a great way to even have an expression of that with the Lord of like, Lord, I'm choosing to make all of this really quiet and really serene and even beautiful. I'll even throw a little, you know, rose in a vase right here. Not so much for the picture for Instagram, but for the picture in your heart, Lord, this is what I, this is how at home I want you to be. This is how at home I want your word to be. I think that's kind of a fun way of thinking of abiding, of actually being at home with the Lord, making an environment that he wants to be there. That, that there's not the, the rest of the junk in there, but you're kind of you're kind of straightening things up for him. You're cleaning things up. It's like when Pastor Brett says that, yeah, you can kind of roll in here on a Sunday or a Saturday for church and you know, you can be in your shorts and you know, it's not a big deal. We're casual on the outside, but on the inside, man, we have respect, reverence, and we're all dressed up on the inside for the Lord because that's what, that's what he is owed. That's what he's due. So I, I do love a little bit of both sides of that, of that little cozy picture, but abiding and having him in, in your heart in that way. So it said there at the beginning of six uh, in, in uh, verse 10, it said to be strong in the Lord. And so I want to focus in on that strength part too. And some of these verses are very familiar to you, but this is not the, the Nike, you can make the free throw shot. I know, wrong audience. You're like, we're girls. But I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I love the context of that verse because it's actually a verse speaking of contentment. It's a verse speaking of looking at to, to Jesus to to do the things that is just the next really hard step that you're doing in a really awful situation. That, that's the in his strength that it's talking about. Another one there that we can look at is in Isaiah 40, 31, and I love this, but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. Now, I told you at the beginning, the very, the, one of the reasons I so wanted to look at the armor of God was because I was just feeling like, man, studying biblical womanhood, it's kind of a time where you sort of feel like everybody wants to just kind of throw stuff at you contrary to what the word is. But also this weariness piece, that was the other reason that I felt so drawn to the scripture because I, I can't tell you how many gals I've probably talked to or overheard at the Starbucks or something that says, I'm just, I'm just tired, I'm so tired. And we all know that May Sember is a very, very real thing and you're just tired. You get weary of doing it all. And you know, not to over-spiritualize everything, but. Portland in particular feels weary. It feels dark and it feels hard. 
And, and you know, you'll know what I mean if you travel to another place. You like, you go visit your, you know, your sister or your brother in, in, in Texas or Idaho. You, you go to a different state. I don't know why, but the air, you just, it just breathes better. <laughs> it's just, there's, it, it, there's a lighter feeling there in some ways. It's kind of dark. It's kind of hard. And it's making us feel real tired. But greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. And we need to be reminded of that. And it's so important that we keep reminding ourselves of what his strength is, because that's what we get to tap into. I'm gonna give you a couple more of these because I really think we need to be reminded as we're tired, it's his strength. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. One more here. Seek the Lord and his strength and his presence continually. Just, just do that, right? So all four of those verses, I think those are good ones for us to be reminded when you're tired, when you're feeling that you don't know how to do this in the Lord, in his strength. So important for us. So skip down here to, now we get to the armor of God part. We're gonna get here to, in, in Ephesians 6, 12, this is where we get the scripture that sets the stage for why we need this armor in the first place. And Paul tells us this. He says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Okay, it's a very descript verse and it doesn't sound real good. And you don't wanna show up to that fight in your jammies, okay? So that's why he's setting this up to say, here's the thing, this is, this is what you're doing here. I wanna break some of these words out so you can see these, but that wrestle, the word there is, is like a grappling and like close hand-to-hand -hand combat. Um, I, none of my kids ever did wrestling and I was kind of glad if you've had kids that have done wrestling, it's just kind of gross, okay? It's, I mean, there's just a lot of full contact and a lot of sweaty, I don't know. I just, but when I think of wrestling, I think of this, this type of thing, this, that kind of picture, that grappling of like, it, you are in it. And it's, it's just kind of, um, it's just a scrappy fight. And there's chokeholds, I don't even know. It just doesn't sound pleasant, okay? But that's the kind of fight, okay? It's not the like, it's not a girl fight. It's, it's not like a little push and like, you know, no. It, it's, like, it's like a really deep, close, you're gonna get probably scratched and bloodied a little bit fight. It's that kind of fight. But he says that we're not doing that against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, authorities, cosmic powers. So rulers there is to talk about any of the commanding supernatural being rulers against the authorities themselves. Okay. I want to just remind us that because don't, don't be bummed. Christ is in charge of this too. If you flip back in Ephesians 1 and you go to verse 21, I just want to read that to you real quick. Ephesians 1, 21. And it says, For above all rule and authority and power and dominion above every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the age, uh, but in the one to come, he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church by which his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. I just want to remind us that, yep, this is kind of a, like a verse like, whoa, there's a lot going on but don't forget who's in charge. Christ is the head of those things. So, but against the ruler, so we, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We don't wrestle against the, you know, the, the people that we see. It's actually against rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers in this present darkness. So the cosmic powers there is worldly influences. Cosmic powers sounds so like Star Trek-y. Worldly influences sounds like, you know, your favorite Instagram, you know, influencer. Worldly influences, that can be there. When I think about biblical design and the things that the, the, that the word has for us and the things that the world says of us, there's a lot of worldly influences that are just gonna wanna poke at you and say, ah, no, 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 that isn't what it is. So that, again, it's setting that stage for why we need this armor over this present darkness. This is the one that's probably the biggest no duh for us here, but it's this sphere, it's this world that we live in that's dominated by sin, and then I love in the definition that it puts an ignorance of God. Ignorance. It, and I'll put this on both counts. You know, we understand those that have the ignorance of God that don't know him, that don't know his word, that have never accepted Christ and have been born again. We, we understand that there's an ignorance of God there, but there's actually an ignorance of God even that we can fall prey to when we believe what the world says about God as opposed to what our Bibles say about God. And so we need to know what the Bible says about who he is and not be in that camp 
to be part of that present darkness. We want to have a, a knowledge of who God is. And he tells us that we can know him. He says, let him who boasts boast in this, that he knows me. So that's a really good invitation there for us to get to know who God is. So these are all these things that, that we're supposed to be mindful of as we're kind of looking at why we need this whole armor thing and why this is going to be something that, that you can't just go be unawares about. We need to not be ignorant of it, of it also. But I think it's a good reminder, because like I said, sometimes we think that the person that we're fighting against or the person that we have a disagreement or a miscommunication with, that it's all them. It's all them. I didn't do anything wrong. No. But it, 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 it's, it's, be, it's more than that. It's not the person that's right in front of you. It, it's not your spouse. But we fight, there's, we're living in this world that is a fallen, sinful world with sinful people in it. And we have this reality. And I guess that's what I want, for me, I want to be reminded of the reality. Don't sugarcoat it. This is the reality that we're here. And the, and the world is dark and the enemy's arrows are kind of coming from every direction. But the implication is that if we don't put on the armor of God, we will fall and you will get taken out. So Ephesians 6, 10 through 20 needs to be a passage that we know that we understand because we need this. So he starts this whole passage and he says a very simple word that probably everybody can understand. And he tells us to stand. Stand is the first thing that is said there in verse 11. It says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. And then he says it again, just in a couple of verses there in verse 14, and he says, stand therefore. Now I kind of like this because guess what? Almost everybody can stand spiritually for sure. Even if you physically cannot stand spiritually, you can stand. And why? It, it's, it's an interesting posture to the Lord. Sometimes we're, we see in the Old Testament and in other places of scripture that a, even a posture of prayer was to stand before the Lord, right? It's just, but it's, it's just, you're just standing there. It doesn't take a lot of technique to know how to stand. Um, I love it, the Bible knowledge commentary. It's a great commentary. And it said this about this particular thing. It said, Christians are not to attack Satan or advance against him, they are only to stand and hold the territory Christ and his body, the church, have conquered. See, that's a different message. Sometimes, and I'll put this in sometimes the ignorance of God that even Christians can fall into. We fall into this message that's like, oh, we need to charge Satan. We need to, you know, we need to battle up and we need to take this fight to him. Ephesians says, stand, just Stand. It's not that you're doing nothing, but you do just need to stand. And I like it because it's pretty simple. There's not a lot of technique to it. I see a lot of Psalm 4610 in standing. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Be still, just stand. So that is the, the beginning part of getting our armor even on in the first place. You gotta stand. I also think there's a really cool implication because if anybody has ever tried to put a shirt on a moving toddler, right? It can be done, but like the armhole is over the head and you know, who knows where, where things are. It's not easy to do. And so he just starts and he says, okay, be still, stand, stand there. And then he's gonna put on the implements that we have here in the armor of God. So the first one that we see is the belt of truth. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. Now, the cool thing about belts is they're the, well, now they're just a fashion accessory, I suppose. But back in the day, they actually were to keep everything on. So it's really important that you have the belt of truth because it, it's gonna hold all the things. It's gotta be first, because if you don't, it, it's, it's just not gonna be a good look, okay? So hold everything together. This goes on first. So what is our belt of truth? How do we do this? And again, thank goodness, the scriptures gives us the de definition for what truth is. So John 17, 17 is one of these. It says, sanctify them in truth. And then it says, what is the truth? Your word is truth. It says, Jesus is, these are Jesus's words in John 17. And he's saying that the word itself is true. 
So again, back to being abiding, we gotta know what that word says so we can be in there. But the, the truth, the thing that holds us together is his word. Another one here, Psalm 119, uh, 160 says, the sum of your word is truth and every one of your righteous rules endures forever. The sum of your word is truth. This is so great because this means everything you read from Genesis 1 all the way to the very last word of revelation, the sum of it, all of it is true. You can rely on it. There are all kinds of books and sites and all kinds of things you can read. Some good, some not so good. Got to keep your discernment factor in check. This one, you can take a load off, right? Every single syllable in this is true. And, and that holds us together. When we're doubting things, when we don't understand something, we can go to the word because we can rely on that it is true. We also know that as who Jesus is, that he is that truth. So it tells us in John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by me. I never, I don't know the songs that they pick, but I always love how the Lord seems to orchestrate what we need to be worshiping and, and praising the Lord with, and then scripture that he brings in, you know, 30 minutes later that nobody knew about. But Jesus is that center. He's that belt. He's the thing that holds everything together. And, and, you know, when we're in these weary times or you're in that like struggle and the wrestling and all of the things that are going on, yeah, that's when you feel like, yeah, I really, I need the duct tape of Jesus to hold me together here. The other thing I, I think there's an implication here with putting the belt on first is that we should probably do it first as well, right? So it, I love this one in the King James Version in Proverbs 8, 17. It says, I love them that love me and those who seek me early shall find me. Now the implication is here, all the early risers wanna go see, it's biblical that I get up at 5 a.m., but others that you're like, I really don't wanna do the whole early morning thing, think of it, it's, it just means do it before you do anything else. Do it before you get involved with, with other things. Do it before you talk to your friend. Do it before you even call your doctor. You know, seek him first, seek him early. That's, that's the implication there. One of the things that I was researching recently in a different state was talking about the knights and uh, the, the lady of the knight, it was, it was her job as she is helping the knight get all of his armor and all of his pieces on and all that stuff. She actually helped him do that. But she was the one that she would um, put the belt on him. She would come and she would fasten the belt on him. And I think that's an interesting picture because how do we even do that, put that belt on around our own families? You know, do we, do we secure the belts over, do you pray over your spouse, even when he doesn't know? Do you pray over your kids? Are you fastening that belt of truth and, and pointing them to Jesus first, early? I think that's an important thing for us to do. And it's an, it's an absolutely vital part to the armor of God. So the truth is that we need this armor. With biblical design, there's all the things that that people will kind of throw at you and say, well, so like you're saying, you really think that women are, are, are not supposed to be elders and pastors? Like you really think that? I guarantee you there is probably more than 50 of you in this room that have heard that from a friend or coworker or a family member, probably recently. You really think that? What's the truth? What does the word say? We can go to that and go, well, that's what it says. You really think, you really believe that a wife is supposed to submit and respect her husband? Well, what if he's wrong? What does the word say? What is true? So it, this comes to that belt that is on first and early. Do we believe his word or do we not? Is it the thing that we're going to let us hold us all together? Or are we going to leave it aside and nothing else is going to be on and it's going to be real embarrassing and we're going to be real exposed? That's what, it, that's what it comes down to. So that's the picture. So that's the belt of truth. The next thing on the list for the armor of God is the breastplate of righteousness. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now, the, the great picture with the breastplate is it's the thing that's gonna protect the vital organs. Like, it, you know, this is the heart's back here. You, you got some things that you really don't want damaged. That's the breastplate. So you can think of the breastplate as something that's there to protect you. So what does that look like for us to go to the word and for us to be putting on these spiritual elements of a breastplate? Proverbs 4, 23, it tells us, it tells us to keep your heart with all vigilance for from it flow the springs of life. 
So the heart's one of those things that's behind that breastplate. And, and the heart is one of those things that, that here Proverbs says, it's like, keep it with all vigilance. Like it's saying this one's a really, really big deal. Protect this. What is that? What does it look like to do that? And here it tells us why. Because if you don't protect the heart, from it flow the springs of life. So the opposite, death. You don't, you don't protect that heart. You don't guard what goes into it. It's going to affect the other things that come out and it will affect the springs of life, it even says. So we started with the word and the truth and Jesus is that word, but he's also our righteousness. It always comes back to Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5, 5, 21 says, for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him, we might become the righteousness of God. Again, finding our protection, our safety in not what we do, but in Christ who became sin and he became the righteousness that we might become the righteousness of God, it tells us. So on our own, apart from Jesus, who is our righteousness, that, that heart, the lungs, the vital organs there, figuratively speaking here, are all exposed and they're unprotected. But Jesus, that breastplate, he keeps us. And, it, and it's just gonna keep coming back to him. One more with this on the protection of 1 John in 3, 7, he says, little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. So this is an interesting implication. It's telling us that we need to practice righteousness. What does that look like? How, how are we supposed to practice putting on Jesus who is our righteousness? I kind of like that put on thing. I know that sometimes people think that that's like, you're just being super fake. Oh, you're just putting out a big Jesus smile, like everything's fine and all that. It's a misunderstanding really, I think of what's going on in the heart, right? You can be in the most dire of circumstances and you can have a joy that you eternally know it's all okay, even though it doesn't feel good right now. We can, that's a way to practice and put on Jesus. Because anytime by, by the power of his spirit, that we deny something in our flesh and instead identify with Christ, we're practicing righteousness. So, and the, and the flesh, the invitations for the flesh are gonna be all the time. So little mini word versus world that we can do a little bit, but we could say there's, there's the things that my flesh says, there's the things that Jesus would tell us. Couple real quickly, I am woman, hear me roar. We love that, I am so strong and empowered, right? That's what, that's what the world wants us to say. That's what my flesh wants me to say, okay? But Jesus just reminds us, I am created in his image to do good works, which he prepared in advance for me. Isn't that amazing? Like even the good things that we do, and, and, and the word says, there are good things that you do because I've prepared them for him, but he's even the one that prepared them. You didn't even really come up with it. If it's good, it came from him. Every good and perfect gift comes from the father. Uh, so another one, I am enough. We hear this one all the time. I probably beat this dead horse into the ground, but it's just really important because it just won't seem to go away either. His grace alone is sufficient for his power is made perfect in weakness. For whatever reason, I, I think this would probably throw the world on its head a little bit. It actually is almost comforting just to acknowledge that, yeah, I'm kind of weak. I'm kind of frail. In Psalms, when it says you are but dust, boy, high praise, right? It's not an insult. It's to recognize a reality of we're weak, but it is his strength, it's his grace that is sufficient for us. So these are all things that I think we see when we practice righteousness, that, that we can do these things and kind of capture those thoughts of this is what it is, but, but this is what the word says to do. So practice it. But keep in mind that sometimes we can use to do the practicing righteousness thing. And especially when it comes to biblical womanhood, we can be like, I'm gonna be like, I, I, I'm gonna do this as, as picture perfect as possible. So one of the things that we can turn the practicing righteousness thing into a little bit of a works-based, like, ooh, how can I do this? There's this, there's this little movement out right now called the trad wife movement. And so if you don't know what the trad wife movement is, it's fine. Some of you are like, well, isn't this a good thing? Well, some of it actually kind of is. Some of it kind of is. So these are kind of the aesthetics that you'll kind of get from, from Instagram on like what the trad wife is. I mean, you, 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 you throw on your apron and you bake your bread and you homeschool your kids. And, and, and the thing is, is that the, the world, this has become such a phenomenon that uh, in this, you know, feminism age that there's all these gals that are like, no, 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 no. I actually want to stay home. 
I actually want to take care of my kids. I actually want to like cook and not just, you know, not just phone in dinner here. I, I actually want to put effort into these things. And the thing is, is that as we have like examined biblical womanhood, there's a lot of things that we are called to do as women that we should, we should think about. Is that what your family has called you to do? And there's a lot of good things. Now, CNN did an article about these trad wives. And uh, one, here's a little snippet of this article that it said, because the world is aware of this thing. So it's kind of funny to me. It says, these young women belong to a small subculture called trad wives. They're short for traditional wives. Trad wives aren't your average stay-at-home moms. They sneer at what they consider to be modern-day feminism with its girl bosses and its ungratifying grind and wax lyrical about the value of traditional gender roles. Shocking. Crucially, they promote submission to one's husband, sometimes evoking fundamentalist Christian principles in their beliefs. Many trad wives also share their far-right views on LGBTQ relationships using phrases like the natural order in references to gender roles, and some promote homeschooling to avo avoid exposing their children to progressive ideas about sex education and gender identity. Okay, so far so good. Maybe I do need to sign up to this trad wife thing, okay? But here's where I wanna poke at this just a smidge, because the problem is, anything that we are practicing righteousness can also become, start to come dripping with like comparison and outward appearances and a very workspace thing on like, see how good I'm nailing this whole biblical womanhood thing. Like I, I'm even making my own sourdough starter. <laughs> like I'm not, even get, I'm not even getting it from someone else. I'm making my own, you know? Now, again, I, I'm, presenting both of these things. Because what I want to do is I want to encourage the wife, the mom, the single gal who doesn't feel that the Lord is calling her to make her own bread and throw an apron on and learn how to sew, that our righteousness is not found in appearances, okay? It's not found in appearances. It is not found in what you're going to compare yourself to who's like, it's even if you go on Pinterest and you type in trad wife aesthetic, whew, it's like a load, Okay. Don't fall into this comparison game, this practicing righteousness, this practicing this biblical womanhood thing, which is a good thing. I mean, I read that article to you guys and just about every one of them, I'm like, check, 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 check. We can measure that against the word and go, well, the Bible does say there's only male and female. So th those are good things. But be careful that we don't make it a practicing of a works-based comparison thing and making sure everybody kind of sees that we're just nailing this thing. Check your heart on that. But I also wanna encourage the woman who does feel called to make her own bread and homeschool her kids and, you know, and do all the things that she, she has determined with the Lord that she's been called to do in this season of life, that just don't be so critical of the ones that aren't doing that, first of all, but just keep doing what the Lord has asked you to do. This, this is the thing that we like, to tell, we like to tell ourselves or tell other people that this is the way this biblical womanhood thing should look. We don't get to say that anyway. God gets to say what this looks like. So just, just be cautious of the ways that we can bring in, because gals, we do this. We, uh, you know, we like to make things pretty, so we like to fancy it up. But sometimes we can get, throw in some judgment or we can throw in some things about for those that the Lord has not called them to do. If you are doing and measuring how you are living out your life as a woman, walking according to God's design, according to his words, you're doing it right. And, and we need to just let go of some of the other things that could look a little too, get caught up in too much of a workspace and a comparison thing. So just be careful of that. The practicing righteousness thing is denying your flesh of the things it really wants to do and putting on Christ, recognizing that he is the one that's doing all of it. It's not us at all. So there's, there's our breastplate of righteousness that protects us, guards our hearts, for from it flow the wellsprings of life. I think that's important for us to remember that connection there. The next part in our armor of God is that we gotta get our shoes on. We gotta get our gospel of shoes piece, our gospel shoes of peace on. So the, this one, I, I've always, I used to really struggle with this particular analogy because when I don't, when I think of the armor of God, yeah, I think of the, I think of all of the outward pieces. Like I think of the sword and the breastplate and the shield and all this stuff, this is cool. Your shoes? And shoes are a little bit of a sore spot for me anyway, because you know, most of the time I would just be in my tennis shoes all the time and, and, and I, I just didn't really understand this thing. 
But one of the things that I, as you study the word that you see that is about shoes is that if you're gonna go somewhere, you gotta put shoes on. If you're gonna stay home, yeah, you don't have to wear your shoes. But if you're going out, you gotta get some shoes. And every one of us, if you have kids, you've had a kid that you've got to the store and you're like, where are your shoes? And they don't have them and they're at home. And you're like, cool, I'm carrying you. You have to have shoes to go places. And so our, the gospel shoes of peace pictures for us this, that readiness, that, that spiritual readiness, even have actually having the, the readiness of what needs to be on the tip of our tongue, okay? So Matthew 28, 19, we see what this looks like with the Great Commission. Go therefore, Jesus said, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He says the very first word, the very first command, he says, go, go, be ready. But you gotta have shoes on for that. And that's why the, the, the gospel of peace, it, it says, what, what does that look like? Shoes that carry the gospel of peace? He wants us to go with the gospel. Like that should be something that is on our, 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 our minds, even when we're at the store, it should be on our minds of what, that we have that gospel of peace because you shouldn't leave home without that. We need to have that. We need to have that readiness. The, the contrary part to these shoes, sometimes why I love that these, it's picturing gospel shoes of peace because if we're to capture some of the worldly so-called uh, wise words, their shoes look a little different. Um, I, I grew up and I think, I don't even know if it was a current song or if it was, maybe this was even vintage back then, but do you remember Nancy Sinatra's song, These Boots Are Made For Walking? Okay, yeah. And I, it's, it's kind of hilarious because I knew every word of that song back then, girls. I, I mean, it didn't even kind of hit me what it's really saying, but that song, it says, these boots are made for walking and one of these days, these boots are gonna walk all over you. And now we kind of get that from the world standpoint because they're constantly telling women, yeah, just do what you want. March on, walk all over you. That would not be the gospel shoes of peace. <laughs> so let's, let's uh, switch those out at the store here. So what does the gospel uh, shoes of peace, couple scriptures here on this, 1 Peter 1.13 says, therefore preparing your minds for action. This is one of the ways that we can have that readiness and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So readiness here, what do you need to leave the house with? You need to be able to prepare your minds for action, okay? So don't phone it in when you walk out the door. You actually need to be prepared for the conversations that you might have. Best way to do that is to spend some time with the Lord in the morning. Lord, prepare me for this day. I, I, I love praying that the Lord would ordain our steps, right? We have, you can plan things. I'm a planner. I love to plan every single minute of my day and I can do that, but... It's the Lord that ordains our steps. So prepare your minds for that in advance. Prepare your mind that you are going to need to be ready. And Ephesians is telling us to be ready with what? Be ready with the gospel. So don't forget what the gospel is. This is something that should be on all of our minds. And actually, I know it's on the board here, but if you have your Bible, flip to 1 Corinthians 15. I, I love that we can provide these things on the keynote and, and the slides, and you can always look them up afterward, and that's great. But the thing that I love also, especially when it pertains to like scriptures related to the gospel, is knowing where they sit on the page of your Bible. Because it never fails, it will, you'll be somewhere and you kind of get that deer and headlights look when somebody's like, well, what is the gospel? I don't know. So I want you to see where it sits on, the, on your page. So 1 Corinthians 15 verse three says, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. Here you go. Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scripture. So in other words, just as he said he would, he did. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And then it talks about the people that he was seen by in his resurrected, um, resurrected body. That's the, that's the simplest gospel. Romans 10, nine and 10 tells us how we are saved. We'll get to that in a second. But know that this is the gospel. This is the good news, that Jesus died and he didn't stay dead. He rose from the grave. So know where that is on your Bible. Be ready and know what the gospel is. That is part of that readiness that we need to have. The next th part of our armor here is the shield of faith. The shield of faith. So shields, again, we don't, we don't even see these. At least we have a context of what shoes look like. But most of us aren't walking around with a shield. But one of the things that 
the, I loved, um, Spurgeon made a note about the shield of faith and, and he, uh, he said that Satan is a defeated foe and he said, I believe the word which is translated shield sometimes signifies a door because their shields were as large as a door and they covered the man entirely. I think that's an interesting picture because if your shield is there with like, you know, the size of a door, our shield's there to help put the fires out. You know, you can kind of, you can kind of stand behind it and let the, let the door, let the shield take all of the hits and, and we can stand back there and, and be protected, but also letting it take the fires, you know, it take the arrows. Psalm 5, 12, again in, the, in King James, it says, for thou, for thou, Lord, will bless the righteous with favor and will thou compass him as with a shield. Man, so, I mean, this is how the Lord presents himself in his righteousness, that, that he's fully covering you. So much, the shields were like the size of a door. And if, you, if it helps you, just go ahead and think our big barn doors. That's okay. That is the shield of faith. And that is the thing that is, is, is catching those arrows that the enemy throws at us and is putting things up. Spurgeon also said this. He said, the, the faith is like a shield because it is no use if, except it be well handled. A shield needs handling and so does faith. So this is an interesting one because uh, before we're saying when you're putting on the armor, you gotta stand, okay? Just stand there. When the shield comes, it says you do have to hold it. You gotta grip it. It's not gonna just stand there by itself. It's an interesting one. So it's the shield of faith. You have to, you have to hold it to use it for, as protection from the enemy's arrows. If you don't possess it, if you don't grip it, if you don't hold it, it it's, not gonna, it's not gonna do anything. It's not gonna stop those arrows of the enemy. So sometimes people think of faith and they think of it as like, well, you just have, you Christians have like a blind faith. You just believe, you can't see God, but you just believe, that's weird. Well, that's not exactly the, con that's not a, a right biblical context for faith, really. Our faith is not blind. Um, dic the dictionary defines that as that, if, uh, that faith is to have belief without true understanding. That's what it says blind faith is. But our faith isn't that way because we do have understanding. We have pages and pages and pages to help us understand who God is and why he is trustworthy and steadfast and, and faithful. We see that. So we can have great understanding from his word and what we're having faith in. So that's the thing that we hold on to. But having faith doesn't mean that we just, you know, cross our fingers and, and wish that things just work out and like just hope for the best, right? Faith is in something and the in, again, it's gonna come back to Jesus. Jesus is the thing that we have faith in. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing, it is the gift of God, not the result of works so that no one can boast. This is the thing that is, is guarding us and helping us have protection and put those fires out from those enemy's arrows. So I, I've said that a couple of times, but why, what are we talking about with the arrows? I think, man, all the things that you're gonna have to take captive in your thoughts about messages either that the world says about who you are as a woman or what, what different things that you should be doing, those are enemy arrows all the time. Your shield of faith, the thing that you know that God is reliable, that his design is reliable, man, that you can just stand behind that. But the enemy is a big fat liar. He is such a liar. John 8, 44, he doesn't say fat, but I'm saying it's, it's pretty close. You are the father, you are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. He does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks lies, he speaks out of his own character for he is a liar and the father of lies. He, he, he doesn't even possess the ability to tell truth. But the thing that's tricky about him is just like we saw in the garden in Genesis 1 when we studied that, that in Genesis 3 rather, that he, is, he makes it sound so good. He can lie so well and they sound great, but they're a lie. It's a lie. And it's so much so that it, it, it's, it's a lie is what brought in the whole fall of man was a lie. So we need to be, we need to know he's a liar. He is going to try to lie to you with things that are against God's word. So the word says it, he's gonna come up with a way to try to poke at that and tell you that isn't true. And he's gonna try to plant seeds that lie to you. 
That's why you wanna hang on to this so much and stay with that shield of faith because this is the, the, this is the part where you're just gonna to have to constantly combat these messages, okay? So, you know, the, the um, world will tell you, I'm not happy in my marriage. And so the lie is, I must have married the wrong person. That's what the world says, that is the lie. But what does the word say? Matthew 19, six says, what God has joined, let no one separate. And that's including you. That's not like, you know, that was for someone else. Nope, that means us, that means me. So capture the lie there. The world says, hey, girls, wear what you want. The lie is it's your body. You can do whatever you want. The word says, yes, dress modestly. It says that in 1 Timothy 2, 9, 10, but it tells us in Romans 12, 1, that our bodies belong to the Lord. We are a living sacrifice as unto the Lord. So that's a lie. That's a lie. Capture those things because those are the, the things that, that the enemy wants to throw at you and throw at your, but if your shield of faith is right there, it's gonna capture them and you're gonna say, nope, Romans 12, one says this. What God has put together, let no man put us under. God's word has said this. That's your shield of faith right there. So then we see this, this shift with the armor of God pieces from, from the take up. And because it says the take on the shield is actually a different word because it's kind of like, it's just holding it, but it's like longing and, and maintaining to just have it there. But then once you get to this next part, the helmet of salvation, it says to take, it's a different word. And it says, take on the helmet of salvation there. So this is something that there's actually, it's, it's, there's a little action here. It's not, it's not just, there is the standing, right? We've got the standing. We've had the um, holding, you know, gripping our shield, but now you actually have to like bend over and you got to take on the helmet of salvation. This one implies here that there's a choice here because this is where you got to go, okay, are you saved? The helmet of salvation. When, you, when it comes to the elements of what the helmet is gonna protect you from, the headshot is the only kill shot. So regardless of, you know, if, if an arm gets taken out of all that, you'll, you'll probably heal from that just fine. The, the implication here is that there is a, it, that there is an eternal stake here, right? That's the kill shot. If you are not saved, that is the thing that truly is the defining moment there. Romans 10, nine and 10, I referred to this earlier because this is how you know if you're saved. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. You have to, but that's, you gotta take that up. You have to actually lift it. It might be a heavy helmet for you at first for you to kind of wait, 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 I, but I didn't do anything to earn this. I didn't, this seems too easy. There's, there's things that you're doing, but placing that helmet, Romans 10, nine and 10, that's the thing that saves you. Nothing right could go in your life for the rest of your days. But if that helmet of salvation there, that's the only kill shot right there. And if it is intact, if it's there, if you've done this, this is a blip on the radar. You have all of eternity and it will be beautiful. And there's no friction. There's no conflict. There's no sin. There's no death. There's no mourning. I can't wait, but you have to have the helmet of salvation on. So that's why that is a really important part to have in your armor here. Next one, the sword of the spirit. I won't spend too much time on this one because this is kind of what we're doing all the time. Okay. This is the word. We know that, uh, they, it, that because it says that of itself. It says, which is the word of God? The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So the word, the word, the word. If there's a broken record that we play here at AC, that might be it, but it's a really good record to just keep playing. Because we know it's true. We know it's reliable. We know we need it. This is the thing that is the sword of the spirit. So be familiar with it. Know what to do with it. Psalm 119, 105 tells us that your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So if it feels really dark in this present darkness, let's just get our little flashlights out and shine it just to even to the very, very next step. It might not shoot very far down the path, but you'll be able to see the next step. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Also Hebrews 4, 12 here. The word of God is living, it's active, it's sharper than any two-edged sword 
piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Um, if you really read that verse, there's some, there's some pain and there's some surgery in that verse often. So know that when you pick up your sword, it's, it's actually, it's sharp. It's not a spoon. So it might do a little surgery there, but that's okay. That's a good thing for us to do. So we have all of our armor in place by this point. And he's shown us what each of those elements look like. And I know that's a lot. And I know there's a lot of scripture, but I want to take us to just quick three points to leave you guys with, because Paul wraps this whole discussion up with just some encouragement since we're dressed. Now you're dressed for the day. This is what he wants to leave us with. And he says this in Ephesians 6, in verse 18, he says, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication to that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. And also for me that, thy, that words may be given to me and opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. That is the passage that, Sometimes when you read a very, I will say kind of like a hallmark passage, like the armor of God, we read those sections and we kind of stop there. But these verses are interesting and really pack a lot in here also, because this is his summary. This is his final encouragement. Like, here's what you need. Here are the implements to be dressed and ready to fight the spiritual battle that you're in. But, but can I just encourage you? Can I just encourage you? And he, and he gives us a couple of things. So here are the things that I just want us from that passage. The first thing he says is just keep alert. Don't have your head in the sand, gals. First Peter 5, 8 and 9 says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. You know, there's, there's a, those two first uh, phrases, sober-minded and watchful. Keep, but you got to be looking. You got to have a head on a swivel a little bit. We know that when we go in downtown Portland, but you know what? We need that even when we're around our house, when we're thinking of the distractions that we're around. But be watchful, be alert, and be sober-minded. I don't think there's any better way of being sober-minded than taking your thoughts and making sure that they are in alignment with what God has. Because as soon as we kind of go out on our own thing, that's not the sober-minded area. That's a little bit of the crazy over there. Bring those thoughts, bring your mind back in alignment to what God's word says and be watchful. We've already talked about how the adversary is out there and he's wanting to tell you that all this nonsense that you've been learning at this Bible study about biblical womanhood and yeah, 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 and going to church and verse by verse, chapter by chapter, you know, all of that stuff, whatever. And he's gonna poke at you and he's gonna tell you some lies about it. But keep in mind too that it says, just resist him. It doesn't say charge him. It says, just, just resist him. The Ephesians 6 said, stand, stand there. So keep alert. The next thing I wanna remind us, encourage us, persevere, persevere. Hang in there. Don't quit, don't quit. Galatians 6, 9 says, and let us not grow weary of doing good for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. There's so many passages in scripture talking about pressing on, persevering. I press on to the goal, Paul says, to win the prize. There's a lot of it. So it would seem that, that the Lord knew you were going to have these seasons or 40 years of them or five years of them or six months of them, these seasons of really hard, really hard. Because we don't have, we, we have so many scriptures that tell us, keep going keep pressing on. Don't get tired of doing, doing good. Keep doing the things that the Lord has asked you to do. And the last thing here, pray. Pray, pray, pray. First Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18 says, rejoice always and pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Rejoice always. Just start even with that. How is it possible to be so crazy happy, dare we say, in, when there's all this stuff going on in the world, when there's things that are so dark and like just blow our minds that we just never thought we would be seeing. Rejoice always. The reason scripture can say that is because we are living for that eternal destiny. 
We are, we're occupying until he comes, meaning we are, we're doing all those things that Ephesians 4 reminds us to in our walk with the Lord, to, to be working hard, to be sharing with others, to be building others up. We're doing those things. That is something we do we desire to do. But keep in mind, do it as rejoicing and pray. Pray, 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 pray. When you have nothing else to do, when you don't know what else to do, just pray. And the enemy, that one of his fiery darts is to tell you that your prayers don't, it's not really gonna matter. It doesn't really, it's not really doing anything. Or one of his favorites I have decided is, you know when you feel like you really need prayer, the very next thought will be, oh, I don't wanna bother them. I don't wanna text them and tell them I need prayer today. I'm so high maintenance if I keep asking for that. That would be a lie of the enemy. There's just, there is, there's not one of your sisters in Christ out there that when you shoot them a text to be praying for you, that they won't gladly do that. But don't let the enemy tell you that, that prayer just doesn't matter. Because the reason he fights so hard to tell you that prayer just doesn't matter is because he knows that it does. He knows that it does. So be praying. So gals, there's been so much that we have learned in this study. And we're gonna keep going because we're gonna dive in even more in the fall of digging into his word on biblical womanhood and on his design. But I think these things going into the summer, reminding us to be alert, watching that, yep, there's an enemy that is it's just a reality. Don't give him more credit than he deserves, but it's there. But be armored up, be, be prepared, be ready and be praying. So important for us. Will you guys pray with me? Oh Lord, I'm just so thankful for your word. I know how badly I need it. I, I'm so thankful that you are so specific. You've gone to such great lengths to describe for us, even giving us analogies uh, as far as armor and, and even down to our shoes of what it should look like. You're so loving to us. You're so, you have so much care to give us all of these little pieces to help us while we're in this world. You prayed, uh, Jesus prayed in, in John 17 that we would not be taken out of this world, but that your spirit would be with us and help us within it. And, and so Lord, I just pray that these gals that are here today, Lord, that they will just hear the words that you have given to each of us, Lord that we would be uh, putting on our armor. Lord, I help, help us when we feel weak and tired, um, just to, to not give up, but that we would just continue to persevere, that we would pray for others, that we would see all things within thanksgiving and just being thankful for the things that you have given us. And it is so much, Lord, you've been so good to us. So Lord, I pray, I pray for the gals that are here in the room. I pray for those that are watching online or those that will watch this even down the road, Lord. I pray that if they hear nothing else, I pray, Lord, that they would check that where their helmet of salvation is at, that they would go to Romans 10, that they would look at this and they would make sure that they know where their eternal destiny is with you and how very much you love us. So Lord, I, I thank you. I thank you for, for your love for us that is so un undeserved and yet you give it so freely. So Lord, I pray that each woman, woman in here and online would just feel that love from you, that we would be able to, as just even a group, be able to encourage each other and pray for each other. And, and Lord, we do just pray for a difference in our families, in our city, in uh, the people that we interact with, Lord. Would we just have words that are, are so truthful, but also with the right amount of salt that you asked ask us to have, that we would be bold and be ready. So Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name, amen.